Welcome everybody to Learn With Lowell. Today we're joined with Tess, who has a background at the Buck Institute, SENS, is now working in cancer. There's going to be a little bit of politics, just for everyone heads up, but let's be kind and sensitive to Tess and what he's going to share with us today. And if you think that we were saying it wrong or we were missing something, feel free to leave a comment. We both love to learn and just do it with respect and we're all good. But Tess, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Sweet. So the first thing, and uh, you're from Ethiopia. There's something going on in Ethiopia that's very big. Uh, I I was thinking it was the dam, but I do know there's conflict going on. So what's going on in Ethiopia that uh, you would like to share with us today? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, what is going on in Ethiopia? Yeah, I mean, the dam, we are constructing the biggest dam in Africa. I think it is mm -hmm. also one of the, among the top 10 in the world. Uh, and, and I believe that will contribute for the economic development of the country. So the dam is built in the Nile River. Actually, we call it Abai. Uh, so that is a good news, uh, and then I think it is near to completion. Hopefully, it will be completed. Like I, I don't know when, but very soon, hopefully. And uh, and that is like uh, it's a kind of a national pride for 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 Ethiopians because uh, all around the world, if you ask people about the Nile Dam, they will talk about Egypt uh, because Egyptians are they were they were effectively using Nile. Uh, but uh, it, it actually, 85% of the River Nile is originated from Ethiopia. Uh, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, uh, due to a lot of reasons, we were not able to use the Nile uh, for, for, for anything. Uh, and, uh, and a couple of years ago, we started to construct this dam, and, uh, and it is going to have a huge, huge uh, uh, relevance for, for the economic growth of Ethiopia. Uh, I think that's a very important development. Uh, unfortunately, the other side, what's going on currently in Ethiopia is, um, is we have been in uh, in a kind of civil war for for almost two and a half years. So, to give you a very brief background of of what is what is the current situation in Ethiopia is that uh, the party called EPRDF is the leader of. Ethiopia for the last 30 plus years uh, and seven, eight years ago. Uh, so, I mean, generally, you know, there is no real democracy in Africa, in most parts of Africa, including Ethiopia. So people, especially the young generation, they start to, to have like a position uh, to, they, they were asking for a change. Uh, and um, that actually causes a crack in the leading party, uh, and they, they divided mainly into two. One is, uh, we call it TPLF, mainly from the northern part of Ethiopia, from Tigray region, uh, which they were actually the most dominant parties of the party. They, they were controlling, you know, the, the main, the key positions of the government. And the other part is from this, southern central part of Ethiopia from Oromia region, which is led by Abiy Ahmed, which is the current prime minister of Ethiopia. And, and, and Abiy, what he did was he used the opportunities of that move, mass movement of the people. And he, he followed this uh, populist uh, act. Uh, uh, and uh, he used that opportunity and, and get the power. And by then, a lot of Ethiopians were really hopeful that based on different kinds of speech that he gave in the parliament or in different uh, places, uh, he promised a lot of things. He promised to bring a lot of changes and then, and that we were really optimistic. Uh, so like significant number of the Ethiopian people was a fan of him. Uh, he, he, he released all political prisoners and all like uh, journalists and politicians who were exiled were came back to Ethiopia, and and it was really really promising development. Uh, but what happened uh, during that time is that the TPLF they know that they are losing against Abiy, so they retreat and they go back to their state in the northern part of Ethiopia, and they organize themselves. and And Abiy also knows that these guys have all the money and all, all the, the military apparatus uh, because they were leading the country for, for about 30 years. So he was also prepared. And we were frustrating that 
we can see the development in Addis and we can see the development in, in, in Makale that sometime the war might start. And as expected, this, you know, two guys from the same party, they start a war against each other. Now, Abi want to maintain the power and then TPLF want to advance to Addis and to regain the power. But the problem is Abi from Oromo, it is in the southern part of Ethiopia, whereas the Tigrans are in the northern part of Ethiopia. They don't even have a neighbor. Uh, so what the TPLF has to do is they have to walk through the land of Amhara to reach to the capital city. And the Amhara people, uh, they have been tortured by the TPLF for, for a long period of time. And they, they were not, they don't want to sit and see, or they don't want to let the TPLF walk through their land and go to Addis Ababa because they know that will be another, you know, uh, dictatorship uh, period. So what they decided was actually they, they, they back Abi. And then they, there was a war between the Amhara people, mainly the Panos, and Abe, the federal government, again, a stipulated. And to make the, the long story, which, which was, that was happened for two years. And then after two years, TPLF lost the war. And what we were really expecting was by now, Abi will take the leadership and then move to the next level. But unfortunately, that did, didn't happen. And what instead happened was they they sit for negotiation. Abi and TPLF, they sit for negotiation. I know there was too much pressure from the United States and Europe. They were pressuring Abe to sit for negotiation because they believe negotiation is the best solution. And yes, it is the best solution. But it would have been happened even before the war. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but that didn't happen. And the big problem here is uh, the Tigrans and the Oromos, they sit for negotiation, excluding Amhara, where the actual war was actually happening in the land of Amhara. And that brings a deep, deep concern uh, uh, by like the freedom fighters in Amhara region. So they ask a simple question. Uh, so the two guys, excluding representatives from Amhara, they, they have a negotiation and nobody knows the contents of the negotiation. And the Fanos from Amhara region, who are like a kind of freedom fighters, they ask about the content of the negotiation. And Abi was not willing to tell what the content of the negotiation were. Mm -hmm. And and that, that brings us a a very big frustration uh, and what they say now is okay then they have to fight for their own freedom and during this time what Abi did the prime minister of Ethiopia what he did was he again waged a war against those freedom fighters in general majority of the, the Amhara people uh, so that is the current war which is going on the mm -hmm. federal government against the people of Amhara. I know there is some confusion about what are the real questions that the people are asking, what the Amhara people really want from this war. And in my opinion, I'm not representing anyone here. I'm just giving you my, my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, I think, very clear questions. And one of the questions, for example, is that the Amhara people, they want a change in the narratives of the Ethiopian policy. Even the Ethiopian constitution defined Amhara people as an oppressor. So they, they, they want a change in, in, in this perspective. They see themselves as an Ethiopians. They see themselves as equal with other ethnics all around the country. Uh, and they don't, they have never been part of like the oppressing, oppressing leading parties in, in history. Uh, I don't know from where this came from. So they don't want to change the narrative. And the other question they are asking is, like about 10, the total population of Amhara would be like 45 to 50 million, whereas the total mm. population of Ethiopia is, I think, around 120 million. Yeah. 
So from this, 10 million Amharas are, are rough estimation, are living outside of their state, mainly in Oromia and southern part of Ethiopia. And because of this bad narrative, they have been displaced from, from different places and they have been targeted based on their, the language they speak and based on their ethnic background. And they are asking the federal government to take an action to, to make sure that they have the right to live in, in their, in their own country. And, and, and I think for that, one of the important component is to have, uh, you know, a political representation in the federal government, in a state government, and in, even in the local governments. And the, 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 the current uh, federal government is predominated by Oromos. And I, I know there are some Amhara there, but I would say they are like, you know, puppets of the, the prime minister of Abiy Ahmed. Uh, they, they, they are not a real representative of the people of Amhara. So Amharas are asking, they want a real representation in the federal government. And most importantly, these 10 million people who are living outside of the state, they don't have any representation in that specific state or in the federal government. So they, they are asking, they need to have a representation. And at the same time, they need to practice their own language they need to practice their own culture, even though they are living outside their state. So one of the interesting thing in Amhara region is that people who are coming from different ethnic groups, they have a representation in Amhara state government, and they have school in their own mother tongue, and they have government service in their own mother tongue. What the Amhara people are asking is actually the same thing to be practiced for Amharas who are living outside of that state. Uh, these are the main questions I think they, they, they are ask, asking. And But recently, there is also like very catastrophic things that are happening in Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa is the capital city of Ethiopia. And, and there are they're tremendous growth for the last couple of years. And now they have like one city called Sugar around Addis Ababa they have a huge plan to have like a big city next to Addis Ababa. And what they did was actually, uh, so that, that land is governed by the Oromia regional government uh, with the support of the federal government because they are the neighbor of the, the federal uh, city, Addis Ababa. Uh, so what they actually did was they displaced 500,000 Amharas around the city. They want to construct a city by mm -hmm. displacing the, the poor people. And, and that is not a fair way of development. If development is good, but, but by displacing your own people based on their language, that is very unfair. That's what they say. Uh, so they want each and every displaced Amharas to go back and settle to their own original place and to have actually a representation in the Sugar City at the same time in Addis Ababa City. So Addis Ababa City and most of that, the people in Addis Ababa because it is like more of like a modern city, they don't see themselves as like ethnic this or ethnic that. They see themselves as Ethiopian. They don't care about ethnic, they don't care about language. Uh, but the reality on the ground is more than 50% of the people who are living in the Addis Ababa are Amhara by ethnicity. And the government knows this. And there is a massive detention of Amharas who are living in Addis Ababa. And nobody cares about that because the administrative system in Addis Ababa, they don't really have a good representatives from Amhara ethnic groups. So nobody is really bringing that question to the table. So, so, so that is uh, a big problem. And the fun part is if, if we talk about the mayors of Addis Ababa, every time when they got a mayor, they got a mayor from the neighboring state, not from Addis Ababa. Can you imagine like DC getting a mayor from Maryland or Virginia, but not from the DC people or yeah. even from California? So that's what is happening. And, uh, and that leads to like a discrimination to some ethnic groups in, in, uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, and, and I think 
the last question they were asking, and the very important question, in my opinion, is that the people of Amhara, they believe they have existential threats. And, and actually, this started 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, uh, we have a very brutal, different government. And people were fighting against that government. And the two major elements that, that came out was, unfortunately, based on uh, pol politics based on ethnicity. One is the TPLF, the Tigray People Liberation Front, based on the Tigray people. And the other is called OLF, Oromo Liberation Front, from the Oromia region. And, and these two guys have, you know, the way they fight for power is by defining Amhara as an enemy. Mm. And there is no logic to define a, a people as an enemy, the whole people as an enemy. And th their excuse is that Amharic is a federal official language. And because the people at the top level speak Amharic, they thought they are Amhara. They are not actually. Even currently, the prime minister of Ethiopia, he is from Oromia, but he is speaking Amharic, he's not Amhara. So for the last 15, 50 years, these two parties were, you know, against the interest of Amhara, the Amhara people. And till today, they have a military power. Till today, they have a bank control. Now, what Avi is trying to do is he wants to disarm this um, FANOS, the freedom fighters in Amhara region, while TPLF and OLF have their full power. So that brings an existential threat for the Amhara. The federal government is not backing the people, and the two guys are still with huge power. So that is a big concern, especially with TPLF. There is a historic dispute between the Tigray and Amhara region, there is no clear boundary. Uh, uh, so the TPLF, when they came to the power, they annexed certain parts of the Amhara region to the Tigray region, specifically Walkite and Raya. These are like very fertile lands because they have the power, they took it back. They took it to the Tigray region. And through this process, the Amhara people managed to gain their land back. But now it has no any, you know, uh, 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 coverage by the federal government. So still there is a concern that if the TPLF advances, they might take the land back and that will cause another level of war. So uh, I, I think this is too much already. Uh, I, it's better to stop here. If you have any questions, yeah. you can ask me. Yeah, yeah, no. He, he, I think he gave a good foundation for... Uh, a ton of follow-up questions that I can ask. So the first one, and I think this will probably be a short one. So the first civil war that that you first, you started with describing with Abi and uh, the Northern Group. I didn't remember the Northern Group name. I remember Abi. Tipia uh, left. Yeah. Tipia left. The uh, was the result of that more democratic reforms because he, he you were saying he was more of a populist, or was it just like who was going to be in charge leading the country? Yeah. So. When Abi came to power, we were really hopeful because everything what he's talking about was really democracy, development, and then mm -hmm. like, we were really hopeful. Uh, but what he was actually doing was that because he know he can't win TPLF, he has to pretend as if he is with the, the questions of the people. Mm -hmm. So he was just using the people to win TPLF. Once he wins TPLF, he doesn't really care about the questions of the people. And actually, he is again as with the will of the people. So there is no really uh, democratic transition. And not only Ethiopians, actually, a lot of people around the world was cheated by him. You, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if you know that he won the Nobel Prize for peace. No, I don't know that. Yeah, he won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2019, I guess. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the reform that he brings to Ethiopia and mainly because he settled the war, no war zone in, in between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Eritrea was part of Ethiopia and now they have an independent country and there was another catastrophic war between Ethiopia and Eritrea a long time ago. 
and there was really huge instability in, on the border, mainly were, were like supervised by the UN. And Abiy came to power and he suddenly became a very good friend of Isayas Aforge, which is the president of Eritrea. And again, mysteriously, we don't know what kinds of negotiation he made mm -hmm. with Eritrea, but they suddenly become very friendly. And all the questions we had, and we lost like 70 million people for, for that war, for basically for nothing. And, and we don't know how they agree, but they agree. And Ethiopians were happy, were moving to Eritrea for a visit, Eritrea is coming to Addis for a visit, and things were going well. And, and even the Nobel Prize Committee told this guy, the brilliant guy, he brings such tremendous change, and they give him the Nobel Prize. And all of a sudden, things change. Now, mm -hmm. he's not anymore a friend of Isaiah Saforki, and we are not anymore friends with Eritrea. The mm. flights has been canceled for a couple of years. And and again, why that's happening? We don't know at the first place. There is no like, you know, open discussion. The people don't know what kind of agreement between these two guys were. And we don't know what happened today. So it is it is uh, unbelievable. Yeah, it, it sounds like the there's not a lot of social mobility and you lack the Ethiopia lacks the democratic institutions to allow like normal like if we were disagreeing on something we could like talk it out but like no one has the ability to talk it out so then they all they have is like kind of bullets and other things to like fight it out it sounds like without those principles they're kind of like people are left in these positions where they're all mad at each other when there's not the, the institutions to like work it out in a peaceful way if that makes sense it kind of feels like that is a yeah, huge thing yeah i yeah i think that the, the, the huge problem in my opinion in the current european situation is we don't have a strong institution mm -hmm. Everything what's happening, whether it is good or bad, it is based on the will of one dictatorship, Abiy Ahmed. We don't have a very good institution that will control his power. Even the parliament has no power to control him. He can literally do anything that he wants. If he wants to be a friend with one of the neighboring countries, he can do that without any legal process. If he wants a war with any other country, he can wage a war without getting approval from from the parliament. And mm -hmm. I, and I think you are right. The major limitation is the lack of a strong institution, and and I think we need to work on that. Are there? I'm sure there are, but the what's the how how do you, how do people get out of that type of position? Where there's like everyone's mad at each other and there's not a clear way to resolve these problems is there like a group trying to get everyone at the table is the like i guess if we were trying to un it just feels like a really big like gordian knot like all these different things going on so then how do we yeah. untwine it so people can you know go about their day you know feed themselves take care of their families live you know do, you know have prosperous lives how do we how do we get to that position when we're, we're at right now it's like you know you know, people are dying and all these other things are happening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I think uh, it would have been much easier in, if you take, for example, the current war between Abiy and the Am Amhara people. Actually, the Amhara people are the number, they were the number one supporters of Abiy. Mm. They were really happy when he came to power because he was pro-Ethiopia. And what they want is a united Ethiopia and a stable country. That's what they really want. And, and what they are asking today, it is not really like all the questions that they are asking is basic human rights and basic democratic rights. And, and I think he needs to sit and think about his track record. Like mm -hmm. I would say 90% of Ethiopians were marching, were demonstrating, supporting him like a few years ago. Now they all are against him. And it's a simple question he has to ask why. And not only that, during this reform, there are a lot of people who are supporting him. Actually, it was a team. Now from that team, he is the only one. All the others are either they were killed by him or by his supporters, 
or they are under prison. Mm -hmm. And now he is the owner in power. And, and he has to realize that he can't go anywhere through this process. He has been in a war with the Tigray people for two years. Now he is under war with Amhara people almost six months now. And there is here and there war in Oromia region, in the region where he is from. There are a freedom fighter against him. So if people all around the country are against him, definitely the problem is with him. Mm -hmm. And he needs to sit for discussion. Simple as that. He needs to sit yeah. for discussion. And the only way is to sit and discuss and to have a transitional government. Other than that, war from one war to the next level of war, from one war to another war, he is not going to survive, definitely. He will never win this war because it's a war against the people and he's not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And he has to think about that. I hope he will have advisors. The advisors need to see this reality. There is no way that a government will win the people. So the best solution is they have to, they need to be seen for discussion. Yeah, it reminds me of the, when Stalin took power in Russia, like one of the first things they did was to start like kind of like have another revolution against their own supporters like Trotsky and them and then mm -hmm. um to like centralize their their power further which hopefully is not a direct parallel because that means there's like 60 more years of Ethiopian struggle that's about to happen but at the same time maybe economic development the the dam seems like it it'll raise everyone you know maybe maybe put more money in people's pockets lights all these other things with it which might distract people from the fact that they don't have certain freedoms um, so it's like it's it does sound like from an outside person's perspective and someone who's just learned about these things it's like as the dam comes online and people are a little bit more prosperous uh like it could just potentially distract people from like what's going on you know it's like uh, if you if someone's full and happy it's like how you know versus like if they're not full happy and they're realizing they don't have the ability to excite like put their will towards their environment um is where like a, a power keg or something could exist i'm curious both abby abby does he ever like sit down and just like, I would just, you know, like have like a two hour conversation saying like, hey, this is why I'm doing this. This is why it's the best thing for everybody. This is the future for Ethiopia. Like, is there ever like a really like, like a 60 minutes, like top great reporter really going to do a great job? I'm not a reporter. I wouldn't know how to do it. But like, does anyone like sit down with the guy and just get him to like really explain his perspective on the future of Ethiopia? Uh, oh. Yes, to some level. So, mm -hmm. so even his party, he, he also he changed the name of the party, and he called it Prosperity Party. So his vision is what he said is prosperous Ethiopia, and Ethiopia who is going to be like like among we are in low income country. His vision is to have like a middle income country in certain period of time, and. The question is, now, how, how are you going to achieve that? Mm -hmm. What are like the roadmaps? He doesn't have any roadmap. At least there is nothing that the people know. He might have something in his pocket, but there is nothing. But the main frustration that the people have now is because all these political parties are based on ethnic group, and he is from Oromo, and and his party, at least, they see themselves as Oromo first. They give a priority for 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 Oromo, and that, but that doesn't mean that the Oromo people are actually benefited from his leadership. He is just pretending as if he is a representative of Oromos. And and significant number of his supporters from Oromo, they get whatever they want. They get the power, they get, you know, like corruption all over the country, and and they are constructing parks here and there, uh, like beautiful parks, but would that have like job opportunity? No. It's just a park. 
every time what he shows us is the type of park he's constructing every now and then. We don't see like, you know, uh, like real change to the country, reform to the country, you know, at the policy level. And, and I think the dam is a good example. If you have like a real plan that will bring an actual change to the people, that that by itself unites the people. And I remember when we started the construction of the dam, that was a unifying power. Whatever difference we have, everybody was agreed on constructing the dam. And but I don't see a single plan that Abiy Ahmed bring to the table, which I think is like a very good kind of indication that Ethiopia is moving forward. So yeah, yeah. There's a there's a Netflix Netflix documentary and there's a book which is like the dictator's handbook for staying in power, and it sounds mm-hmm. like the guys you know more or less running that that playbook because it's like the you you um you know when you have things corruption what have you you empower the people that keep you in power there's like three people like whoever runs the military yeah. you know your original people from that got you there and you keep them well fed and you know you give them lots of money and then you keep the base really well fed and then basically you can ignore everybody else it's really an interesting yeah. really uh really interesting uh i think it's on netflix as well there's a book on it i emailed the guy who who uh wrote the book a long time ago but uh it kind of seems like he's kind of playing that that playbook so at the same time, it is it is kind of tragic. It sounds like to me that uh, to go from like you know a populist, maybe some good democratic reforms are about to come. Like everyone's really excited for that potential, yeah. and then to have like this bittersweet, you know, constant struggle and feeling of being ignored and like you're not even able to voice your opinions and have questions asked and stuff like that. It seems like a really tragic story for Ethiopia, and in Ethiopia is like you know a really historically rich you know part of Africa. Um, and so I, I hope, I hope like, you know, things improve, but from what it sounds like, it seems like it's just the conditions for improvement aren't there. Maybe after the dam is there and there's economic upliftment, maybe people will care more. You know, I don't know. It's just, I don't see anything that suggests that like, it's like 10 years from now, we had this conversation again. I, I feel like yeah. it'll be just another thing, you know? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's actually my worry also. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, this, this instability happened seven, eight years ago, and then sometimes it gets slower, sometimes it gets like. Uh, but it's 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 very exhausting, exhausting, mm-hmm. uh, and, and and it's really frustrating. And and as I said, the only solution is if Abi sees the reality. Mm-hmm. He need to open his eye. He need to see what is actually happening on the ground. And if you can't win the people there is no way that you can kill 50 million people and stay in power. That will never happen. And he has to understand that. And and it, it would be nicer if he have the gut to sit for discussion with all parties. I mean, all parties, they have their own interest. And he can sit and discuss. And that's the only solution that I can see. And uh, I'm worried that... Uh, he is not ready for that. Mm-hmm. If is you it... see the different kinds of interviews he is giving recently, he is super arrogant. He doesn't really care. He pretend as if nothing is happened. He never talked about the ongoing war. So this war is happening for almost six months. He has a zero statement about the war. He has he mentioned anything about it. He pretended as if you know, last week he was moving to his like village and showing all the fertile lands and then you know the the you know the park that they are doing there and then he was saying like okay Ethiopia is growing see this what is happening here that is not his job. Mm-hmm. He has an, a minister of agriculture as part of one minister job. His job is to bring peace and stability to the country. And it, it, it looks like you don't know his job description. He yeah. is, I think, not the right person. It, it is, it appears too much for him. Take like 100 million people 
rich of culture, rich of different ethnic cities, rich of history, and he doesn't really understand how big Ethiopia is. He believes he can solve the solution by, by like, you know, killing people. And the way he refer is that these are not the people, these are actually the extremists. Mm-hmm. And then you can't refer like 50 million people as extreme. And yeah, I wish there is a shorter way to come to a solution, but uh, it doesn't look like uh, that, that, that I think there is no more. It might, it might persist for long. Yeah. Is there anything people listen in or you or anyone, um, is there anything we can do from where we are to like influence it in a positive way? Is there, I don't know, if we knew what, uh, you know, wherever yeah. Abi got his news, we could just all like flood the news with like opinions. But, uh, yeah. What what can people do to like help this uh this this like tangle knot? I I I think uh I think I I, I saw some uh news I don't know when like a few days ago that uh a Blinken had a call with him. Uh so he he expressed his feeling that he he is deeply concerned on what is going on. And I think the only way he doesn't really care about whatever, like if you are an activist or like uh, a media journalist, you can say anything. It would be great for the people to get a coverage, like to get a coverage in BBC, CNN or Al Jazeera, like so that the world would understand the real character of this guy, how brutal he is. Uh, that is good. But to 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 bring a real change, I think, the hand is mainly in the United States and European Union. They have the, the, the upper hand. You know, most of Africans, they are entirely dependent on, you know, a support from the, from different kinds of aid. Uh, so they can put a pressure on him. That is actually how they bring a negotiation between Abi and the previous war, Abi versus TPL there. There was a massive pressure from 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 the U.S. specifically, and and in general from the, the from the, from the UN members, and that brings him to the table, even though the discussion or the negotiation was not as expected. And for now, I think the Biden administration need to need to push him, need to see that people are dying. There is a massive human rights violation. So they need to see that and they need to put a pressure on him. Uh, if that's not going to happen, uh, I think the other alternative solution and probably, uh, I don't know, arguably might be the best solution is that the people continue fighting and they will, they will overthrow him. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it might take time, but eventually always people win. Yeah. I mean, that's the, uh, from earlier you mentioned, you know, represent, what's like taxation without representation? Like, that's kind of like where America came from. And with yeah. the, the story of the, the having a mayor that you didn't even elect and have that representation, that's huge. Um, yeah. I, I love, uh, Ethiopia is one of my, uh, favorite countries in, in Africa. I, I've, I'd love to learn more about Africa in general because when you look at the world map, Africa looks like, oh, it's the size of America or South America or Europe because yeah. they, they distort the map. Africa could eat. Europe, even though Europe's not a continent, you know, but that's a different thing. It could eat, you know, like in terms of like the size, like pretty much North and South America. It's a it's a massive place. There's so many different people there as well. Um, yeah. Guys, I I love the uh, you know before we're going to talk about aging, but you know, uh, presumably we're going to have a normal life, you know, 70, 80, 90 years. I love by the before our you know our time, we're able to go to Ethiopia and it's a peaceful place and everyone's prospering and playing soccer, whatever the heck they want to do with a, a nice dam that's powering their powering them and their neighbors and everything else like that but um well uh maybe people listen in you know we can send good things in their direction or, or just think about this stuff or at the very least learn more um read books or anything like this to to understand it and um because you never know what just knowing more can do to how you can influence the world in my opinion so um but he went from ethiopia and then he went to singapore which big contrast in terms of uh uh stability you know if you're going from ethiopia where there's a ton of war to uh singapore which is just up and to the right prosperous 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 uh granted it's a, a city of like what 20 million you know 
less than 20 million people versus like a country of 100 million of multi, you know, multi ethnicities. Um, and that's where you got, I believe, your PhD. Yeah, from Singapore. Yeah. So then, um, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so before I moved to uh, Singapore, I was a teacher actually in Ethiopia, uh, mm-hmm. uh, one of the university, University of Gondor. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I teach biochemistry and I did my master's in biochemistry. And uh, uh, I remember the first time I was impressed uh, or become interested on aging research uh, was, um, I think in the biochemistry 101, uh, the last chapter, there is this topic called aging and cancer. And what aging? Okay, there is there is a cool science about aging, and that, that's the first time where I become aware about research on aging, and uh, and then and then you know after that I I watch different uh, YouTube videos, especially from Aubrey de Grey and other like prominent guys, and it looks like the huge amount of interest on the biology of aging all around the world, specifically in Europe and the United States. And that's why I became mainly interested on aging research. And then uh, I was looking for a scholarship. And uh, to make the long story short, I got that scholarship from Singapore. Uh, it's called SINGA, Singapore International Graduate Academy. And I went to the National University of Singapore. It's one of the best universities in the world and best city in the world. Uh, it was a great opportunity to get that. Uh, and uh, I went there and... Um, and when I went there, I don't know what kind of research to do. I was I, I just got a scholarship and they give you the opportunity to to have a lab rotation and see which one attracts you the most. And when I do that lab rotation, uh, there is this guy called Jan Gruber from Germany. He was starting his own lab and his background is actually in physics. Uh, and he become like a biochemist. And his interest was, uh, so he was going to give a speech and then the person was introducing him and the way she introduced was, I still remember that statement. She was saying he is a physicist and he became a, a biochemist and he wants to apply the principle of physics to resolve the mystery of aging. Oh, okay. This sounds interesting. And uh, I watch, uh, I mean, I attend uh, the, the presentation. It was very good presentation in aging Alzheimer's disease. And immediately at the end of that talk, I talked to him, I emailed him and uh, we met at Starbucks, have a discussion and then decided to join his lab. That's how I, I start my journey in uh, aging research. Yeah, so yeah, so just to give you a brief background, what I did in Singapore mm-hmm. is that, uh, okay, the first question he asked me, what do you want to do in my lab? And uh, he has one idea, I also have a different idea. One of the interesting idea he was mentioning is was, uh, which, which was not successful, I don't want to spend so much time on that, was, uh, but there are ongoing research. Like when I say successful, I was not successful in that project. Doesn't mean that that project was halted. It's just still ongoing. Uh, he want to use this. You know, the Earth has a magnetic field, and he has the artificial electromagnetic field. He want to apply that to a specific to induce this uh, process called hormesis, uh, specifically mitohormesis, a hormesis in the mitochondria. Uh, so the hormesis is to make it simplified a little bit of stress and that stress actually will activate your you know defensive mechanism especially specifically your immune system or antioxidant system and you become resistant to other stresses and that actually gives you a better health and lifespan and i was working on that but at the side project what i was thinking with him was that there are tons of evidence that it is possible to extend lifespan, uh, at least in modal organisms. Uh, but if you really look the effect size, it's very small. It would be in worms because they have a very short lifespan. You can you can extend lifespan up to 100%. But if you go to in mice, you can see like 15, 20%, not that much. So... 
I was asking myself why. Why we are not able to extend the lifespan more than 15 to any percent? And in my opinion, aging is, you know, it's a multifactorial trait. There are several variables in it. So you need to target all of them to have a larger effect. So what I proposed by then is uh, instead of targeting one pathway or one gene in particular, it would be better if you have a combination approach. So targeting multiple age-related pathways at the same time to get a synergistic lifespan extension. And that's why where my PhD journey starts. And uh, I listed out all the drugs that are known to extend lifespan, all the pathways that are known to, to regulate aging and uh, uh, lifespan. And uh, we did some RNA seq and try to predict the, you know, the synergy based on uh, transcriptome profile or RNA sequencing. And, uh, and uh, finally, we managed to get two drug combinations that really shows a very good synergistic effect where one drug extends lifespan. I was mainly working on uh, say elegant swarms, but we also work in, in fruit fly, drosophila. And a drug could extend 20, 30% lifespan, but when you combine the two, it close to 100% lifespan extension. That is a huge effect size. Uh, uh, oh yeah. So I think what we learned from that is there is no like one magic bullet that regulates aging and lifespan. There are several variables and we need to address all of these variables in order to have a better and healthier lifespan. Uh, I think that is the message, the main message from, from, from that study. Even though it is in model organism, it needs to be tested in mice, it needs to be tested in human, but, but we know the pathways that regulate aging are conserved across a species. So, so the science could be applicable in humans. I'm not recommending to take a drug, but you know, we pretty much understand that there is no single gene or single pathway that's the master regulators of aging. There are several variables and we need to understand how these different kinds of variables interact with each other to have a better health span, lifespan extension. Are you familiar with Michael Levin's work? Um, is it Tufts? Bioelectricity? I, not that. Not the details. Oh, okay, I'll send you his work after this then. And um, okay, uh, he, I think it'd be interesting to read more about him. Uh, but anyways, the cool. So you, you like you went deeper. You went to Sens, uh, Buck. You did a lot more research into this subject, and I think you're more you're deeper into immunotherapy and how the immune system works in terms of aging. Which I think yeah. if you're gonna I think if you could affect change on the immune system, it'd be really cool if we had like radial dial, we could like turn it up, turn it down, like really like nuance it. Like I, I think that would help out a lot of people, especially with autoimmune disorders, like just a ton of value in that. But what what opportunity do you see there when it comes to aging and, and the immune system? Okay. Uh, I can slowly walk through how I become interested in immunology. Uh, I'm not immunologist by training. So mm -hmm. once I did, I completed my PhD, I came to Sense Research Foundation because I thought it is somehow related with, with what I believe. Like, so Sense have like seven strands. So every degree when you start the Sense Research Foundation, but by the way here, I'm not representing Sense or any institute. It's just my personal opinion. Uh, but um, so Sense, ha they define seven types of damage in the body. And they believe that unless we target each and every damage, unless we repair each damage, there is no way to have like better, healthier uh, lifespan extension. And, and, and that agrees with uh, what I said in my PhD, like combinational approaches. And, and actually what we're currently doing is a combinational therapy, which is interesting. So, so when I came to Sense Research Foundation, uh, the other question I was asking was, I was becoming mainly interested in senescence or cellular senescence. These are cells that uh, cannot divide anymore in our body. So they persist in our body for a relatively longer time and they secrete tons of like pro-inflammatory cytokines and chromokines which cause cancer or which cause aging and age-related diseases. And so we need to remove these uh, senescent cells 
Uh, and that is how one way of extending lifespan, at least in modal organisms. So there are different approaches of removing the senescent cells from your body. Uh, one is senolytics, and the other is immunotherapy. So in senolytics, actually, you can see senolytics and senomorphics. Senolytics are drugs that specifically kill the senescent cells, whereas senomorphics, they don't kill the senescent cells, but they mask the bad effects of the senescent cells by reducing the secretion of the SAS factor. Uh, but the huge limitation in the senescent field is that um, one senolytic drug kills one type of senescent cells, but not other type of senescent cells, depending on the type of the cell or depending on how they become senescent. So it looks like, forget about aging, even at the cell level in cellular senescence, it looks like there is high heterogeneity. So we really need to understand the different types of cells in our body, the different type of senescent cells in our body. And, and there are pretty much good amount of evidence that shows that senescent cells are really highly divergent depending on the type of tissue, the type of damage that causes the senescent. But I see one huge uh, limitation on the field, uh, like in 2008, 2009, when I started uh, at Cells Research Foundation is that a lot of people are really interested on senescent cells. This, I refer them as artificial senescent cells because those are easy to study. So the way they induce senescence is they have a cell line or they take a primary cell from, from a donor and they culture in vitro and they artificially induce senescence using different kinds of methods, uh, methods mainly using uh, drugs. So that's really interesting. That helps us to understand. And my question was, is it actually the real senescent cells that is present in our body? Is that going to be translatable? And, and during that journey, what I understand is there is one important component of senescent type that was not really investigated called secondary senescence, or some people refer it as paracrine or bystander senescence. And I strongly believe that this is one of the most important type of senescent cells in our body because there is tons of evidence that shows that once you have a cell which becomes senescent, they produce tons of uh, SAS factors. These factors called SAS stands for senescence associated secretory phenotypes. And these factors, they propagate the senescence to the neighboring cells or even to the cells that are far distant from one tissue to the other tissue. So that is, it. generally I call it secondary senescent cells. It could be paracrine or juxtacrine or bystander senescent. So now the question is, we have a couple of drugs that are known to kill senescent cells. So my question is, are these drugs effective on killing the secondary senescent cells? And the reason I'm asking here is, even though there are really promising senolytic drugs and some of them are under clinical trial, and there is at least two or three clinical trial reports that shows that the senolytics are actually failed. And we don't know why they failed. And by then my hypothesis is that, okay, we have secondary senescent cells in our body, but whether the senolytics are effective against the secondary senescent cells, we don't know. So we, one, we need to understand what the secondary senescent cells are. Second, we need to test if the approach that we are using to kill senescent cells, the primary senescent cells mainly, the artificial senescent cells, are effective on the secondary senescent cells. And then I start like deep dive of the secondary senescence journey for three years. And uh, uh, to make the long story short, what we found is that actually the secondary senescent cells, they are, they are entirely different from the primary senescent cells. Hmm. So, so at the first place, we need senolytics because the senescent cells are resistant to this. And they are becoming resistant to this because they have upregulations of the pro, uh, sorry, uh, anti-apoptotic process. Apoptosis is a programmed cell this program and senescent cells are known to be resistant. And the main reason that makes them resistant is 
because of the upregulations of proteins that inhibit the apoptosis process. And when we compare this pathway in primary and secondary senescent cells, it looks like the secondary senescent cells they have a different pro-survival mechanism. And for that reason, significant number of senolytics that we tested, they are not effective in killing secondary senescent cells. I think that is why, at least partially, the reason why the clinical trials in senolytics are not successful. Uh, yeah, that, so that's one of the main journey I was uh, studying. And uh, uh, I think a follow-up study on this one is that you can stop me at any time if you have any question. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so once we know the difference and similarity between primary and secondary senescent cells, the other interesting question we're asking is, do they have something in common? Because that's really important, right? If they have something in common, then you can target that common pathway and then just avoid both primary, secondary, and essential. And, and when we look at that, what we found surprisingly is that uh, iron metabolism was, was actually the top common pathway in both primary and secondary senescent cells. And then I said, oh, iron, okay. What, what, what is the role of iron in aging? What's the role of iron in senescence? And then, then, then I, I, I become more and more interested in, in iron. Uh, so first thing, the type of iron, there are two types of iron. They referred as ferrous and ferric. Ferrous iron, the toxic form of iron. It's also called as labile iron, whereas ferric iron is the stable form of iron, and it is very important, especially in the blood, heavily present in different parts of our body. It is very important in, in different processes, including DNA replication and different kind of metabolic processes. But the ferrous iron, the toxic form of iron, so when we compare the two types of iron in senescent cells, senescent cells actually, they have high levels of this toxic iron. And that, that is one of the interesting things what makes cancer cells and senescent cells similar, actually. Cancer cells also have tons of this toxic iron, uh, which is actually bad. We need to remove that iron, but we don't know how to remove that yet. So what is the role of that toxic iron? And the role of that iron is actually interesting. There is a process called ferroptosis. The ferroptosis is, we already said that senescent cells are resistant to apoptosis. Uh, so there is an alternative mechanism of cell death called ferroptosis. So this is also a programmed cell death depending on iron. So what will happen is if you have tons of labile iron, it will undergo a process called fenton reaction which produces tons of reactive species, especially the reactive oxygen species, which will cause damage to the plasma membrane and rupture the membrane. And then through that process, the cell will die. And that whole process is called ferroptosis. But what we saw in senescent cells is that even though they have really high levels of uh, iron, they are still resistant to ferroptosis. And, and first thing what we propose is that, okay, they have iron to undergo ferroptosis. So they are primed for ferroptosis, but the process is not sufficient to execute the process. So can we have like a small molecule that, you know, activate the ferroptosis process to push them down to the hell? And we did a small screening of ferroptosis inducer drugs and we found one drug uh, which is really interesting, uh, to to selectively kill senescent cells. Uh, and it's still, it is a model organism study, not in humans, but but it is interesting. Uh, even though it's interesting biology, but one of the major limitations of applying the ferroptosis inducer drug to the clinics is that the way, the mechanism they do uh, is by by interfering with your antioxidant system, specifically the, the glutathione antioxidant system, which is very important. And we don't want to do that in humans because antioxidant systems are very important for, for a lot of things. So 
we ask, do we have an alternative way of targeting the senescent cells based on the high level of iron they are accumulating? Uh, and for that, uh, what we found is that uh, this uh, pro-iron drugs, where you have a cage, you put a toxic molecule or a small molecule in a cage and deliver that to the cell. If you know, your normal cell takes that drug, nothing will happen because the toxic molecule is within the cage and they can't break the cage. So it is literally not toxic. So it will be excreted. But if that cage is taken up by senescent cells, which have high iron level, so the iron will break the cage. So the cage is pretty much sensitive to iron. So it can be easily break by the ferrous iron, by the toxic form of iron. And then what will happen is the toxic molecule will be released within the cell and the cell will undergo death. And we managed to specifically kill senescent cells that way without minimal or no effect to, to the non-senescent cells. So that is the one like new ways of or approach to kill the senescent cells in, in the senolytic field. Uh, I think that's pretty much about the senescent and mm -hmm. senolytic drugs. And the other approach of targeting senescent cells is using uh, immunotherapy. Yeah, if I, if I can just stop you there. The, uh, we had a, 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 a cued my audience for questions, and I think you mentioned clinical trials a minute ago, and I just want to uh, ask you a question about them. The One second, let me just pull up the art. They didn't give a name. They specifically said not to name their name because they gave me a real name. So then um, when it comes to senolytic clinical trials, anything involving that domain, um, and you know, quite frankly, we can make it larger from that as well. So starting with there, and then in general, what, what, which, what is the um, paraphrase in here? But what clinical trials do you think are going on right now, or about to go on, that are going to hit and affect people the soonest? Essentially, what research do you see that's being translated to clinical trials, or soon be in clinical trials, that's going to be affecting people's longevity and aging? Uh, starting with uh, senolytics, which is what this person asked, but I think the larger sphere as well would be a good part too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so uh, in, regarding the senolytics, uh, there are clinical trials undergoing uh, uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, startups, I don't know if I have to mention the name. Uh, there are also clinical trials uh, undergoing in, uh, in my clinic. And actually, there are two reports from my clinic and one oh. report here in the Bay Area. Uh, uh, they are, unfortunately, they are not good news. Uh, so yeah. three reports and three of them, in a way, they are, they, they, well, the my clinic is a bit different. The one which is reported here in the Bay Area is clearly it's not successful. They were, they have their own small molecule that targeted tenescent cells and, uh, uh, I think they tried it in arthritis and they were not successful. Uh, and uh, the other two clinical trials in my clinic is, um, I think still they are helpful. There is no indication that they clear the senescent cells and improve any indication. But the, the only the positive side they report is that they are safe to undergo larger clinical trial. They don't see any side effect. So that we they can continue a larger size study. One of the major limitations of that trial was the trial, the first trial was only in six patients and they don't have a control. So you can't really make any conclusion. The only thing you will say is there is no adverse effect. And the second one was the test in 12 patients. Uh, six take the drug, the other six, they don't take the drug, and then they compare. Uh, and then the N number is very small. You can't do any six with an N of six because there is a huge variability from one person to the, to the other person. So they were not able to see a statistically significant difference in any of the parameters they test. 
But the good thing is that they don't see any side effects. That, that is a good sign. And, and in my opinion, I think we are too early. We, we really need to understand different type of senescent cells, the way we, I mean, there are people who argue whether removing senescent cells from your body is actually is a good thing or not. So we really need to understand the basic biology of aging before before we move to like interventions. I mean, mm. clinical trials are great, but we are not at the stage where we can like recommend to patients or older people supplement or any drug. Uh, beyond senolytics, I think uh, you, you might already know this. Uh, my my interest and my my belief is that rather than testing a single drug like rapamycin, there are a couple of people who are testing rapamycin in dogs and other other model organisms, and there is clinical trial going on in metformin, the anti-diabetic drug, um, which, which which seems interesting. Uh, but to me, I think uh, combinational approach would be the most promising approach because, as I say, there are several variables in aging, and we need to target several of these factors to to be successful. And uh, I'm really looking forward uh, for the trial that uh, is done that is ongoing by OVDG from LEV. Mm-hmm. So they are really nailing down the details and how to do the combination. Like they have several combinations, uh, and uh, and and I I am really looking forward for that. And and I think that will be, I'm predicting that will be one of the you know, the benchmark work for aging intervention in the in the future. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what he comes out with. Uh, he was on the show earlier this year and. I mean, he's being very open and transparent about what they're doing. So I think, yeah. you know, give it a year or two and we'll see what comes out of there. The, so I know we're, we're coming to the end of time. The, what, I don't know if you have time for reading books or not, but are there any books either, you know, on, on Ethiopia, Singapore, any place you've been in the world, or just your general interests that you recommend people check out? I'm, basically, I'm always looking for books to read. And so if there's a book yeah. that you liked, I would like to check it out. Well, uh, be, be because we are talking about Aubrey, I, I, li- I, would, I would like to recommend Aubrey's book, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ending Aging. As, uh, yeah. if, if, if your audience has like to understand what is aging, and I think that's a very good book by Aubrey Degray and uh, Michael Ray. Mm-hmm. I've had the both on the show. So, uh, you know, I've got like oh, a... Okay. So if you got, if anyone like their episodes, they'd be great books to check out. Uh, any, anything else you're reading? Uh... Yeah, the other interesting book when uh, w- w- that I read when I came to the United States, I have been here for only four years and I tried to understand the culture of the United States and the politics and um, all those things. Uh, it, I think, uh, what is the title? Promised Land by... Uh, mm. Barack uh, Obama. Barack Obama, yeah. That's a good book. I liked it. He wrote, I think, I think that's the one where he wrote before he became a senator, right? He was like, uh, before he became a politician, he wrote it, which maybe makes it a little bit more honest. I don't know. Because, you know, politicians, they you know, they put their thumb on the scale a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, every time a book written by a politician uh, yeah. is, you know, don't take everything as a given. Just just mm-hmm. read it and take, take what you want to take. Then uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show today, for sharing your knowledge on these various diff- different topics. Um, Tess, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thank you very much.